and all in here. You guys are up. Chris is here. Chris is up there. Thank you, Chris. And Bill, Bill, and then one, yep, two years and years. Um, but what I wanted to announce to you today is I want to introduce you to Darlene, and she is here on behalf of the Right to Clean Water petition. Um, and so she's going to tell you a small blurb about that and then have petitions for people to sign if you are so inclined. So that's me, and I'm out of the way. So it's all over. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. It's nice to see such a large turnout for a very important event. Um, as Sarah was saying, I'm a volunteer. Um, and I'm helping to collect petitions for the Florida Right to Clean Water. And what we're wanting to accomplish is we want to get an item on the ballot in 2024 so that we, the voters, can vote on it. And it's to put, um, if passed, it will put an amendment to our state constitution here in the state of Florida. And that will ensure us the right to clean water. Um, it's going to help um, enforce um, and make people accountable for polluting our waterways. So I have petitions here that I'm collecting. I will leave some back here on the table. I would greatly appreciate it. All you have to do is a registered voter here in the state of Florida. This is a statewide initiative. And believe that we have the right to clean water. So thank you for listening and please sign my petition. <laughs> All right. Good. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Malcolm McFarland. I am a uh, research professor at Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute down in Fort Pierce. Um, we're now with Florida Atlantic University, um, and I'm here to talk to you about algal blooms and water quality in places like the Indian River Lagoon and, and other inland water bodies in, in Florida. So I am a, uh, a researcher who focuses on algae, and particularly um, the microscopic algae that we find in um, in coastal waters like the like the Indian River Lagoon, um, so that's this term algae is is a little ambiguous. I think um, maybe a lot of people don't really know what I'm talking about when I say algae. Um, and and algae does include a lot of different types of plant like organisms that we find living in water. But today uh, I'm going to be talking about microscopic algae, um, and these are really um, really important in, in all aquatic ecosystems. Um, and they are basically single-celled microscopic algae, single-celled organisms. So you need a microscope to see them. They're very small, but they're also very abundant. Um, and they're very important in terms of aquatic food webs um, and um, um, water quality um, in the lagoon and in, and in fresh water. Um, so algae also includes things like uh, the sargassum that floats up on the uh, on the beaches um, and large uh, large things that look more like plants. But but that's not what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to be talking about these microscopic guys. Um, so they are planktonic, which means they basically drift around um, with currents in the water, um, and they include a really huge diverse array of different species. They're both prokaryotic and eukaryotic organisms. So some of them are more like the typical plants that we, we see on land. Um, some of them are more like bacteria. Um, algae as a term technically should uh, refer to just the eukaryotic organisms. But of course, to make things confusing for everybody, we also have blue-green algae, which are technically cyanobacteria. So it can get a little confusing. But these are some examples, some images of what I'm talking about um, down here in this slide. So on the left, you see uh, a chain of four cells. And each one of these is an individual algal cell. It likes to form these chains. And this floats around in the water. This one actually has flagella, so it can swim around. Um, on the, this one is called a dinoflagellate. And on the far right, uh, you see another dinoflagellate. 
This is a single cell. This image was taken with an electron microscope. This image was taken with a, a standard light microscope. So they look a little different. In this one, you can see the structure of the cell much better. You can see they're not just little round dots. They actually have a lot of morphological features and, and characteristic shapes to them. Um, this one on the uh, middle right here, this is another kind of algae, a microscopic algae called a diatom. These are really common and important, really beautiful. Um, this one is a, a chain of many cells that forms this nice spiral. Um, and these two are really common. These two types are, are really common in saltwater environments. Um, here we see a special fluorescence uh, image of a blue-green alga. So this is actually a cyanobacteria. These are very small cells. All the little red dots you see in here are actually individual cells, and it forms these big blob-like colonies. Uh, many of them are, are large enough to be seen with the naked eye, um, and they can also be really complex in their shape. This one has some, some openings to it, and they can be almost lace-like um, in their appearance. Uh, so these are really diverse and distinct organisms, um, but they all are microscopic, they all are single-celled, um, and they all are considered part of the plankton or algae, microscopic algae. And I always like to preface these talks by, by letting people know how important these organisms are, because Whenever we hear about harmful algae or algae in the news, it's, it's always negative. We all hear about harmful algal, algal blooms. They can be toxic. They're, they're killing the seagrass. And those are all real problems. But algae in general are, are absolutely critically important to our ecosystems and to the global biosphere as a whole. So this map here is showing in green the abundance of microscopic algae throughout the global oceans. All this green here is where we find lots of algae. And all this algae is responsible for about half of the photosynthesis that happens on Earth. So that means they produce about half of the oxygen that we have to breathe. That also means they absorb a ton of carbon from the atmosphere. And the really interesting thing about algae in the open ocean is if they absorb that carbon from the atmosphere, they can sink it down into the deep ocean where it can be sequestered for thousands of years. So they're really important for biogeochemical cycles of oxygen for carbon, which has a big impact on climate change. Um, so really important in a global sense. They also form the base of aquatic food webs. Um, so this is a typical aquatic food web that you might see in, in the ocean, a coastal ocean situation. Um, something similar it, we see in freshwater as well, maybe with some different cast of characters, but um, you know, up here at the top, we have, we have our fisheries, our, our fish species, things like marine mammals and seabirds. These all feed on forage fish. All these forage fish feed on zooplankton, which are microscopic insect-like creatures or shrimp-like creatures. These all feed on the phytoplankton. So really, this is what's the basis of this whole food chain. So no phytoplankton, no zooplankton, no forage fish, nobody else either. So they're absolutely critical to these ecosystems and they need to be out there um, at, some, at some level. The problem of course arises when we have imbalance in these ecosystems and we get certain species that cause problems. So as I've said, they're also incredibly diverse. So this is not a simple topic to approach. This is a relatively recent um, depiction of our current knowledge of the tree of life, basically, for all eukaryotes. Um, we ourselves are eukaryotic organisms. We're down here with the, uh, we're included with the opisthoconts. In case you didn't know, you're all opisthoconts. Um, that's with things like whales and then even mushrooms and corals. Um, all of the land plants that we're familiar with um, would be over here in the archaeplastids. So that's pretty much everything we find on land, trees, grass, herbs, flowers. They group out in here. Uh, but with these microscopic algae, we find some of them are grouped with familiar land plants. 
but some of them are with these other very distinct groups of organisms. We find representatives from um, the stromenopiles. This is where those diatoms are grouped. Alveolates are where um, we find dinoflagellates. I showed you pictures of both of those a couple slides ago. And then we also see um, excavates in some ecosystems. So these are, in an evolutionary sense, these are very different from the um, common plants and animals that we're familiar with. So they're extremely diverse. And to me, that makes them very interesting. Um, and they've been really interesting to researchers and scientists for many, many years. In fact, uh, shortly after the invention of the microscope, and we were actually able to see these things for the first time, they really captured the imagination and the fascination of, of early microscopists and early scientists. So these, these are drawings from well over 100 years ago of uh, what people saw when they looked through the microscope. This was, of course, before we had cameras that we could attach to microscopes and take nice, pretty pictures. So everyone looked through the microscope and they drew what they saw. And, and some of these just look absolutely fantastical. They look like crazy creatures. Um, but these are examples of diatoms over here on the left. And you can see they have wonderful geometric patterns and shapes. Um, these are dinoflagellates over here on the right. Um, and they have some really just truly bizarre alien-like forms to their cells. Um, and these were, these were drawn by hand. Um, um, these are from a, 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 a book of um, uh, a collection of these drawings by a, a, a microscopist and scientist and artist named uh, Ernst Heckel. And he has an incredible home of all different sorts of drawings of different types of creatures called uh, art forms in nature. So these were, these were really fascinating to people ever since they could first see them. Today, of course, we have powerful electron microscopes that give us really clear, crisp images of what these things look like um, in reality, not just from a, an artistic interpretation. But when we look at them, we find those drawings are not that far off. Um, it's pretty amazing uh, how accurate they really are. And those, those fantastical shapes are not just artistic license. They really are um, some really interesting and bizarre creatures. Um, and they were even used uh, in a very artistic sense um, to make these beautiful uh, arranged slides. This was a pastime of some of those early microscopists. They would actually painstakingly collect different um, cells uh, and, and place them onto a microscope slide in these uh, arrangements um, just because they look really cool. Uh, so these are all... Um, diatoms, and these are actually the the set the shells of diatoms. So diatoms, as a group, they produce um, shells made of silica, which is basically glass. So these are all little glass shells produced by these single cell organisms, and then arranged um, on microscope slides and and viewed in different ways. and And this was sort of a, a pastime of the of the uh, the wealthy and elite. Um, at the time, they would show off their arranged diatom slides. And uh, here is a little video um, to show how some of these cells sort of blur the lines between what is a plant and what is an animal. So this is a dinoflagellate. Um, this is one we can find here in the Indian River Lagoon. This is called a Kashiwo sanguinea, and it has a flagella so that it can swim through the water. Um, you can see that flagella, those flagella beating um, nicely here. Um, and it, uh, it can swim around and it, and it knows where it is. It, uh, it has behavior like an animal might have behavior, but it's full of chlorophyll and it does photosynthesis like a plant. But these organisms tend to swim up uh, during the day to the surface of the water where they can collect sunlight and do photosynthesis. And then they can swim down near the bottom at night where they can collect nutrients that they need like nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizer, basically for plants. So 
The issue with a lot of these organisms is when they grow in excess. And you guys have probably all heard about harmful algal blooms and problems with water quality that we have in the lagoon and Lake Okeechobee and places like that. And what this is, is really just excessive growth of these uh, microscopic algae. And when this happens, we, turn, we call it a harmful algal bloom or, or a HAB for short. And many different species can do this. And as you've seen, there are many different types of species. A lot of these species, they have different uh, photosynthetic pigments that they use to do to capture light and do photosynthesis. And this gives them different colors. Um, so that produces these, these uh, colors of these intense blooms uh, that can be really varied. So uh, in the top right here, you're seeing a uh, cyanobacteria called microcystis. This was an image I took in Lake Okeechobee. Um, and it has a lot of chlorophyll in it um, uh, more than anything else. So it looks really bright green. And you can see this um, really clearly uh, in the water. They're, they're really bright green slicks on the surface of the water. Um, and so it looks like this. Um, in the northern IRL, closer to here, places like the Banana River, Mosquito Lagoon, um, we've had a lot of growth of an organism called Oreoumbra lagunensis, um, which is what has been called the brown tide. Um, and you can see the brown color of the water here in this image uh, really reflects that color of those cells. Um, you might look at this and think it looks like suspended sediment or mud in the water, but it's not. It's actually, it's actually many, many algal cells. Um, some dinoflagellates, um, like the one in the bottom right here, can produce really red or orange colors. Um, and that's what you're seeing here is a, is a really bright orange slick of a dinoflagellate bloom. And then there's other sort of um, even undescribed organisms that we see blooming. This is an image that, uh, that is from the Indian River Lagoon. Maybe you guys remember, this is just from uh, a couple of years ago um, when there was a big bloom that turned the water sort of a, a lime green. It was, it was pretty impressive um, bloom that happened in, in uh, I think it was in 2020 in September and October. Um, so all these different colors, and, and that has to do with the fact that there are different species with these different photosynthetic pigments. Um, so often, you know, we'll call this Oreoumbra the brown tide. Dinoflagellates get called red tide because they tend to have this reddish color. And then sometimes we'll call um, these blue-green algae blooms like microcystis a green tide. I guess we have to start calling this a yellow tide. I don't know. <laughs> um, so when these things grow in excess, um, they can be problematic in a variety of ways. Uh, so the most, direct, um, the most direct problem, and probably the one that is, is of most concern globally with these blooms is that many of them produce toxic compounds. Uh, so we don't necessarily know why they do it. In some cases, it may be for defense. In some cases, it may be for other um, purposes. But for whatever reason, the various compounds that these organisms produce can be toxic to humans and animals. Um, right out here in the Banana River and, and in the Northern IRL, every summer we usually see blooms of a dinoflagellate called Pyridinium bahamense, which is responsible for a lot of the bioluminescence that we see out there. It also produces a lot of toxin, uh, produces a toxin called saxitoxin. The, the microcystis blooms that I showed you an image of in uh, Lake Okeechobee, they produce a liver toxin. Um, so these are, these are problematic. These can be dangerous to humans and wildlife. And humans are usually exposed to this through eating shellfish. That is the most common way of getting, um, getting exposed, shellfish or other fish. Um, but another common occurrence is uh, anoxia. So when these, when these um, blooms get really intense, they, there's a lot of organic biomass in the water. Um, when the bloom is healthy, that's usually not a huge problem. They're doing photosynthesis, they're producing oxygen. 
so it's not a problem. But when they die, when they run out of nutrients and they all die at once, there's a whole lot of organic material in the water that fuels growth of bacteria. And that bacteria consumes all the oxygen in the water very quickly. And that can cause fish kills because fish need oxygen to breathe. And if there's no oxygen in the water, they will die if they can't escape. Um, shading is another really important one around here. So I'm sure everyone has heard about seagrass loss. That has a lot to do with um, shading by these, by these uh, microscopic algal cells in the water. They get really abundant. They absorb all the light before it can reach the bottom where the seagrass grows. Seagrass has no light to grow, and it will simply die. Um, they can also produce mechanical damage to fish, uh, as fish gills especially. So if you look over here, this is a diatom um, called Ketoceros. And if you remember, I said the diatoms produce shells made out of glass. So these, the cells of this are, are um, encased in glass, and they also produce these long glass spines. And these glass spines have little barbs on them. I don't know if you can see very well in this image, but they have like, like thorns on a rose might have. Um, and these can be very irritating to the uh, gills of fish and actually cause them to suffocate if they're in uh, really high abundance. Um, this Akashiwo sanguinea, which is what you saw the video of, it actually is known to produce a lot of mucus secretions. It produces a lot of goo that it just puts out into the water. And this has been known to cause problems with seabirds. So it can destroy the uh, waterproofing on seabird feathers. Then they can't dry out, they get hypothermia and they can die that way. Um, and of course, last but not least, no one likes to see these harmful algal blooms. And so they're not good for local economies and, and businesses that rely on the water for, uh, for their income. And it seems like this is becoming more of a problem. Um, as I said, these toxins can be a direct threat to human and animal health. It's a risk to entire aquatic ecosystems, not just a few, um, a few species or humans in particular. Um, it's detrimental to tourism and, and local businesses. And we're seeing more and more of these headlines, um, especially in Florida. Um, it seems like there is some evidence that these are increasing worldwide, so probably not just Florida, but I think Florida really is on the front lines of, of this phenomenon, unfortunately. Um, this is probably related to climate change in some way. Warmer temperatures are probably gonna favor more microscopic algal growth, but it's also related to just the fact that we have more and more people living near the coast here that are producing more and more nutrients that end up in our waterways. So that's a little background about microscopic algae in general. Um, in particular, there are a number of species that I focus on in the research that I do um, that I think are of particular concern here in the lagoon and also in some of our um, inland, uh, inland waters like Lake Okeechobee. And I've touched on some of these already, but to go in a little more detail so you guys um, know what I'm talking about here, uh, this is the Pyridinium bahamense, the dinoflagellate. Um, that we see quite frequently during the summer in, uh, in the Banana River, Northern IRL, Mosquito Lagoon, seems to be endemic there. As I said, this is a dinoflagellate. Um, dinoflagellates in general make their cell walls out of cellulose, which is basically wood. So we have diatoms that make glass houses and we have dinoflagellates that make little wooden houses. Um, this is an image of, of what they look like under the light microscope, and this is an electron microscope image. They're flagellated, so they can swim. Um, if you look carefully when a, when a bloom is going on, um, if you're out on the water, you can almost see clouds of these cells in the water. They tend to aggregate uh, around noontime. They'll come up to the surface, they'll migrate to the surface, and you can see these billowing clouds of sort of a rust red color in the water. If there's a little breeze going, they often end up in these streaks along the water surface. And uh, 
Those are algal cells. Those are dense aggregations of algal cells. They're found very regularly in this area of the Indian River Lagoon. They love this area. We don't really know why yet, but this is their, this is their home base. We can find them um, all throughout the lagoon and in other places, but this is where they really get most abundant. Um, and it happens every, every, uh, every year. They have a, a cyst stage. So during the summer, they'll grow rapidly. And then um, come the late fall, they will sink down into the mud as a cyst, and they will just wait there until May or June. And then they'll start to reemerge from the mud and start to bloom again. Um, this one does produce a toxin called saxitoxin. Um, and I have sampled and measured for this toxin many times. It's always very toxic. Um, uh, it's really interesting. Now, it, it doesn't seem like we're having major problems from this toxin, which is a good thing. <laughs> um, it doesn't seem to be, do, be producing massive fish kills or poisonings, but it is definitely something to be aware of. It is, it is very toxic. This saxitoxin is one of the most potent natural toxins um, that we know about. It's a paralytic. It will stop your heart from beating. It will stop you um, from breathing if you get a high enough dose of it. Um, thankfully, it does not pass through your skin. So if you're, even if you're swimming in it, you're probably not going to get exposed. Um, but if you drink enough of that water, there's, there could be cause for concern. Most people are exposed to this saxitoxin if they eat a clam or an oyster that has been feeding on these cells. Um, and in one case, I believe a number of years ago right here, someone was poisoned and sickened um, by eating a, a puffer fish that had accumulated this toxin in its flesh. Um, so it is, it is a really interesting, a, a really interesting uh, critter. It's highly bioluminescent, and it, it really is. There are other things out there that are bioluminescent, but I think this is the really, this is the guy that really is um, responsible for most of the bioluminescence you see when you go on those bioluminescent kayak tours at night. If anyone's ever done that, which is really cool. It looks, it looks really neat. It's a pretty amazing sight. If you've never tried it, I definitely recommend it. But pretty much every uh, every summer, it's 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 out there, so you'll probably see it. Um, but I don't know if most of the people out there on these kayaks are aware that it's also very toxic. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so another one that grows up here in the northern IRL is this Oreoumbra lagunensis, and this is the one I mentioned that is called brown tide. Um, this is a type of organism we call a pelagophyte. It's a very, very simple cell organism. Doesn't have fancy cell walls like the dinoflagellate. Doesn't have interesting morphology and shapes. Doesn't have flagella. This one really is just a little round dot. It's very small. Um, and even under a high power microscope, it still looks just like a little round dot. And this is a transmission electron micrograph of a single cell. Not much to it. It is still eukaryotic. As far as we know, it does not produce any toxins, but we don't know a whole lot about this guy yet. Um, but because it gets so abundant, it can result in anoxia, and it has produced some pretty impressive fish kills in the Banana River area. Um, and this one has been um, responsible, I believe, for a lot of the seagrass loss that's happened up here as this particular species. It seemed to show up, um, I think, around 2011, maybe 2012, in the, in the northern IRL, and it has stuck around ever since. It goes up and down, but it seems to have gotten a foothold in this ecosystem and, uh, and uh, has done really well. It's interesting because, as the name may imply, pelagophyte, this was thought to be or originally identified from the open ocean. Um, deep in the open ocean. Um, but somehow it's managed to find a home here in this coastal environment and do very well for itself. Uh, blooms of this have also happened in uh, Laguna Madre, Texas, um, which is where this one gets its species name from, Lagunensis. Um, and like, um, like here, it also stuck around for many years over there when it started to bloom. And this, this is really interesting. Usually these blooms are they can last for weeks, maybe a month. 
maybe two months. This thing stuck around for years when it was really blooming. And I, and I think that's why it really had a detrimental effect on the seagrass. And so this is an example of, of you know, another picture, aerial photograph of the brown water. And this is an example from uh, when there was a, a really nasty bloom of it that eventually died and caused all this anoxia. And these are all dead fish you see in a canal um, just off the uh, Banana River Lagoon. You guys maybe have seen this before, or maybe you remember when it happened. So switching gears now, this is um, the Microcystis aeruginosa, which is the biggest uh, uh, problem that we have in um, the further south in Lake Okeechobee, and then also in the St. Lucie estuary um, when they discharge waters from the lake into the estuary. So this one, again, it's very abundant in Lake Okeechobee. It, it blooms seasonally pretty much every year. Um, I haven't been here for all that long, but every year I've been here and there's been a bloom of it out on the lake. Lake Okeechobee is big, so you don't always see it um, unless you're out in the middle of the lake. Um, but it's clearly visible from space. And these are a, a type of cyanobacteria. So this is a prokaryotic organism. Here's a piece of one of the colonies that it makes. Each one of these little dark green dots is a cell, but they all glom together in this big mucus ball. Um, uh, it, it really, it's more of a freshwater organism. We do find it in the St. Lucie, but it really, it likes freshwater. Um, and it does produce a toxin, which is named after it, called microcystin. Um, this is a liver toxin. So too much of this will really damage your liver and it can kill you as well if you get a high enough dose. The really interesting thing about this particular um, alga is that it has, inside each individual cell, it has these honeycomb structures, which you can see in this electron micrograph here. These, these uh, these honeycomb structures are actually gas vesicles. So they have a little bit of gas inside them, which makes them extremely buoyant. So they float right to the surface very, um, very effectively. And that helps them um, shade out other species. So they get all the light. Everything below them doesn't get any light. Um, it also brings them all right up to the surface where they're really easy to see and they form these bright green slicks. So that means there's a lot of cells concentrated right at the surface. It also means there's a lot of toxin concentrated right at the surface. So we can see them, but they're also very, uh, they're, they can also be very toxic in these, in these bright green patches. Um, this one is, it's, it's very, it also can do some vertical migration. Uh, we don't see that happening too much in Lake Okeechobee because it's too shallow, but it can actually inflate or deflate those um, gas vesicles, rise to the surface or sink to the bottom um, if it wants to. This is also really common in Lake Erie and has been a big problem up north. So it's kind of interesting that it can, it can be really abundant in the uh, in the hot climate of Florida, but also way up north in Lake Erie. Um, so it's a really incredible organism. And like I said, you can see it very clearly from space. So here's a satellite image of Lake Okeechobee. This green sort of mottled appearance that you see across the surface of the lake, that's all that microcystis. And it shows up really nicely because I said it floats to the surface and it's bright green. And then when um, the Army Corps of Engineers uh, discharges from the lake to control the lake level, uh, a lot of this stuff can end up in the St. Lucie estuary near Stewart. Um, and that's what gets people all up in arms. And, and it's dangerous. Um, aggregations like this can be loaded with toxin. And um, while humans probably are not going to be directly exposed to it, because you know we see something like that, we know better than to drink it, uh, People's pets um, have been poisoned. Um, they don't necessarily know that there's toxin in the water. A dog might, has, uh, might drink that water if you're not watching it. And that has happened. Um, and a couple of days later, they die of liver failure. So something to be careful of. And Karenia brevis is another one that you guys have probably all heard about. This is the Florida red tide. 
So red tide as a term in general, generally refers to any sort of dinoflagellate bloom. But in Florida, when we say red tide, it's almost always referring to this bloom because this is such an impressive bloom that happens all the time, off the, mostly off the west coast of Florida in the Gulf of Mexico. But on rare occasions, we do see it um, off the coast here. And this is really a ocean critter. This guy likes the ocean. So we don't see it in the lagoon very much, which is good. Um, it's a dinoflagellate. It's a type of dinoflagellate that does not have that cellulose cell wall. It's what we call a naked dinoflagellate. Um, here's an electron micrograph of it down here. So it has, a, it has a flagella. It can swim around. It can do vertical migration in the water. It produces brevitoxin, um, which is extremely toxic to fish. So it's responsible for an incredible amount of fish kill in, in, uh, over on the west coast of Florida and, and any time it's in any abundance in the water. And maybe you guys have experienced this. I've, I've seen you know, the amount of dead fish that, that can be produced by one of these blooms. And it's, it's, it's amazing to think that there could be any fish left in the ocean after seeing what this thing can do. Um, the brevitoxin is toxic to people as well. If you consume enough of it, it's a neurotoxin, um, but it's also a respiratory irritant. So if you are on the shore and uh, wave action is sort of kicking up spray, you can really feel the effects of the brevitoxin when you try and breathe. I don't know if anyone has experienced this here. It's, uh, it really irritates your nasal passageways, you, the back of your throat, and it'll really it'll make you start to cough. Um, that's the brevitoxin produced by this dinoflagellate. Um, it, can be, it can be an issue, especially for people who have asthma or other respiratory problems. Um, and like I said, it usually forms over here along Tampa, Fort Myers area, but when it gets really bad, it can get picked up by the Florida current and the Gulf Stream. And this happened back in 2017, and it starts to get pushed north, but as it gets pushed north, it can get deposited along our eastern shore, and then we start to see fish kills um, along our eastern shore. And it seems like this is maybe, historically speaking, this is maybe once every 10 years this might happen. Um, so. It'll be interesting to see if that frequency increases with something like climate change. Um, and I think this is the last but not least, this is another um, species that we're keeping a close eye on. This one is really interesting. This is a diatom um, called Pseudonychia. You can see some light microscope pictures of it here. And so it has the glass shell like other diatoms. Usually diatoms are the good guys. These are the good algae that we like to see in aquatic ecosystems. They usually don't produce toxins. They usually don't produce harmful algal blooms. But this one actually does produce a toxin um, called domoic acid. And uh, we have been monitoring the abundance of these species uh, in the lagoon and there can be quite a bit of it at times. We have seen blooms of this that are, that are pretty impressive, but they're not as obvious as a lot of the other blooms. They are small cells that are more transparent. And when you see a bloom of this in the water, you wouldn't necessarily think that it's a, it's a harmful algal bloom. There can be quite a bit of it in the water, but it doesn't discolor the water as much as some of these other species. Um, the neurotoxin that it produces um, actually causes memory loss and brain damage if you get enough of it in your system. Um, it is not always toxic. It doesn't seem to always produce this toxin. Um, but we have measured detectable amounts of this toxin in blooms from the lagoon. So we believe it's out there and uh, it's producing the toxin at least sometimes. There are a number of species. It's not just one species. So there are a number of different species that are out there and are probably producing the toxin. Now, thankfully, this doesn't seem to be a huge problem here on the East Coast of Florida, but it has been a big problem in other parts of the United States. So this has been a big problem off the coast of California. It's been responsible for um, poisonings of sea lions and things like that and seabirds. 
um, uh, where they've had big blooms of it. And just like um, here, they're, they're kind of cryptic blooms. They're not too obvious. Uh, off the west coast of California, these will form subsurface blooms below the surface of the water um, in the coastal ocean. So you don't really know if they're, when they're there or not. And there's some suggestion that this may have been actually responsible for uh, Hitchcock's movie, The Birds. So uh, this, um, a bloom of this uh, pseudonychia was recorded um, in uh, the uh, Santa Cruz Sentinel back in 1961, shortly before Hitchcock was, um, shortly before Hitchcock made this movie. Uh, and it was determined that the cause of this seabird invasion, um, seabirds were um, hitting coastal homes and going crazy and dying. Um, and they looked back at some archive samples and lo and behold, they found a whole bunch of the pseudonychia in those samples. So it's, it's quite likely that um, this seabird invasion, which may have been, because of the coincidental timing, may have been the inspiration for Hitchcock, um, could have been caused by this domoic acid. So a little bit of trivia there. So those are sort of the major players that I see out there in the lagoon and, and the ones that I'm keeping an eye on. Um, like I said before, there are many species out there. So um, there are things that pop up that cause harmful algal blooms that we can't even identify yet, that may be entirely new to science. Back in 2020, the, the cells that caused the, uh, the water to turn that, that yellow green, um, we don't know what that was. And that may be a new species, to be honest. Um, some of these things are very small. Um, and you need to do molecular genetics to identify them. And if they're not in a genetic database somewhere, they could be new, they could be completely undescribed new species that we have no way of knowing where they came from um, or how likely um, they might be to reappear, uh, what threat they may pose, or anything about their biology and ecology. So, what are we doing as a scientist? Um, you know, I find all this incredibly fascinating, and and it really is the focus of my research. And and so what I like to do is I like to get out there, of course, and take samples and see who is there, look look where they are growing, when do they grow, and do these kind of do this kind of basic ecological research that uh, helps us understand how how these organisms interact with each other, how they interact with the environment, and what impacts they're having on the ecosystem as a whole. So we, of course, we go out, we collect samples, we bring them back to the lab, we look them under the microscope, but we, we don't do just that. We do a lot of other stuff. We, um, um, when we're out uh, in the water, we collect a bunch of other types of measurements, water quality measurements. We look at the things like temperature and salinity and pH and oxygen content in the water. Um, we also look at the color of the water. Uh, like I said, the pigments in these uh, cells and 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 the blooms that they form can be of very different colors. So we try and measure that color. And that helps us relate what we see uh, in the water to what a satellite might see um, looking down from above. Uh, we also so another thing we use to measure the color of the water is an instrument like this. This is a, this is an, an instrument, um, a radiometer that is currently installed in the Banana River on one of St. John River Water Management District's uh, monitoring platforms. It's out there right now. It collects, um, it collects reflectance data. So it, it looks down at the water and it takes a measurement of the color of the water, takes a measurement of the color of the sky. And um, we installed this in conjunction with NASA. This is a, a prod. NASA has t instruments like these installed all over the world. It helps them validate what they're seeing in the satellites. Um, so we got one and we got it out here in the Banana River Lagoon. And it's out there right now collecting data. And you can go, you can, if you're so inclined, you can go download the data from NASA's website. Um, and then, you know, this helps us, this sort of in water data helps us relate those cells, those individual algal cells that we see to an image like this, um, which is something we get from uh, the Sentinel-2 satellite, which comes by every few days and takes a picture of um, uh, the lagoon from thousands of kilometers up. 
this is an example of what we might see during a bloom. It, um, this was from that bloom in, uh, in 2020 um, that was bright green water. And you can see all through most of the Banana River and a lot of the Northern IRL here, just bright green water. Down here, we got some clearer water. So you can really see the, the distribution of these blooms really nicely in the satellite images, which is really helpful. And then another thing that I've been doing um, and has been a focus a lot of my research is to develop new ways of looking at these cells in the water directly in their natural environment without having to take a sample and bring it back to the lab. So we uh, have developed at Harbor Branch uh, in conjunction with my colleagues there, we've developed this submersible microscope. Um, it looks like this, we call it the auto hollow. Um, so it, it, it's basically uh, a light source in one of these cans and a camera and a computer in another one of these cans. And there are two windows here. The light shines from this side over to the camera over here. And basically anything that's in, uh, in between these two windows, we can visualize a microscope image, a microscopic image of the cells in there. And, and we can program this and we can deploy it and leave it out in the lagoon so it can do long-term monitoring, or we can even um, hook it up behind a boat. We've got this little housing for it that we can pull behind the boat and we can do transects. And so look at changes in different cell types over a transect through the lagoon. And um, I think it's really gonna change the way we're able to see what's out there, see who's out there and see what they're doing. Um, and as you can see here, it's a holographic microscope, um, which really is, is the sort of the innovation that makes this type of instrument possible. And so what do I mean by holography? Well, it's not this kind of holography. Um, we're not talking um, two-pack at Coachella or anything. It's, uh, it's uh, what we call inline holography. And basically, we're illuminating our cells. Uh, any particle, this could be a cell, um, is illuminated with laser light, this coherent laser light, and it produces these diffraction patterns. And this is what the camera actually captures is these diffraction patterns. And here's an example of a hologram down here. This is what a hologram might look like. Kind of looks like ripples on the surface of a pond, right? If you dropped rocks into it or something. These diffraction patterns can be analyzed with a computer. And we can basically refocus this image after we've taken it to bring the cells um, back into focus. And that's what you're seeing here in these example images. So here's the raw hologram and then we've digitally reconstructed that hologram at 11.8 millimeters from the camera. And we see this chain of cells come into focus. Um, if we refocus that image at 22.6 millimeters from the camera, we see this spiral chain of cells come into focus. And then we can generate this composite image where everybody's in focus. So we can, um, we can look at who's out there in a relatively large volume of water. See the the real advancement here is that we can now look at a relatively, you know, we can look at several milliliters at a time. Um, with a conventional microscope, if you were to try and do this with a conventional microscope, 99% of what you tried to look at in the ocean would be out of focus because you, when you magnify an image really big, your depth of focus gets really, really small. Um, but the holography, we can overcome that. And so that's what we're doing here. I think it's a really cool advancement. And we're, this is a brand new instrument that we've just developed and we've been deploying it um, in very places locally. Um, right now, my colleague actually has it in the Mediterranean over in Spain, but uh, it'll be back here soon. And um, so we've used it to image uh, the Pyridinium Bahamense up in the Banana River. And yes, the images aren't as great as my light micrograph, my my laboratory microscope images, but we can see enough features here to tell that these are pyridinium bahamense. You can see the spines and the shape of the cells. We can see some diatoms with those glass spines here. Um, this is another type of diatom that forms these big spirals. This is what the red tide looks like. This is the Karenia brevis. So we've taken it over to the West Coast. We stuck it in the red tide bloom and we saw lots of these cells. And then there are some other other types of cells that we've been able to see and identify. These are just a few, obviously there are thousands and 
We could spend all afternoon looking at images if you wanted to. Um, yeah, so that's kind of where we're going. That's and, and the idea with this is we can we can put it out there. Um, it can record continuously, um, whether it's a hurricane or whether it's a beautiful day. Um, record every hour, and then we can retrieve that data and look at this high resolution time series of of who is there and what they're doing. It could potentially in the future provide early warning for like, oh, we're starting to see some of these some of these um, red tide cells show up. Everyone beware, there could be a, there could be a bloom about to happen. But in general, I think it'll really help us understand the dynamics of the system better. And uh, that's pretty much all I have. Obviously, all this work is not just done by me. There are lots of people who help out um, uh, with all this research. Um, a lot of my colleagues here are at Harbor Branch with me, and, and we've been very lucky to receive funding from, from a lot of these different agencies, NSF, NASA, and, and the IRLNEP as well has been really supportive. Um, even the um, Office of Naval Research and, and the Harbor Branch Foundation as well has been really um, helpful in, in bringing all these all this research together to uh, um, really get a complete picture and I think push us forward towards a better understanding of what's going on out there in the lagoon and, and other places like Lake Okeechobee. So I guess with that, I'll, I'll take any questions you guys might have. So uh, we are zooming into the digital world. So <laughs> if you have questions, please write them down and deliver them to me and I'll ask them so that uh, everyone can hear the question live and in the digital realm, if that's okay. Um, so I do I do have some questions. Yeah, sure. Um, there's, uh, these are complicated questions. So <laughs> okay. I'll do my best. What, what are the, are there major entities or resources available for education and outreach concerning your work, this type of work, and uh, algal blooms, harmful algal blooms? Well, um, uh, as far as resources available, I, um, I, I think there, there probably isn't a whole lot. I think this is sort of um, an area that, that hasn't received a whole lot of attention. I think it's, I think it's getting better because, because of the, the problems that we've had locally. Um, but I, I try and do talks like this as much as I can. We have a, um, a series at um, Harbor Branch where, where things like this, harmful algal bloom issues are, are brought up a lot um, to educate people who are interested in, and, and wanna come and hear uh, about these problems and these issues. Um, at um, Harbor Branch, we do have our, our visitor center, which has a lot of information where people can come and, and learn about um, all sorts of things about the lagoon and, and algal blooms and, and the ocean in general. Um, but yeah, there, there, uh, there probably could be more resources out there available. I think that's something we all need to, all need to work on. And, uh, we have a question. What is the, how does the algae interact or how does it correlate with muck? How does the algae correlate with muck? Ah, yes. Um, well, so um, these algae, um, like plants, they need they need nutrients to grow. Um, things like things that all plants need: nitrogen and phosphorus, the components of you know what you would fertilize your lawn with. Um, things like muck can trap a lot of those nutrients, um, and when we disturb that muck when it is, um, or, or, or even say when the overlying water column becomes anoxic, changes in water quality can cause nutrients to be released from that. And so um, it could be a source of these high nutrient concentrations um, that could fuel these blooms, algal blooms. Um, but in general, it's, um, yeah, it's it's something I think we need to know more about. Um, and there, a colleague of mine, Jordan Beckler, is is looking into this a lot. I, I think the the relationship, the 
the impact of muck on on the algal blooms and and water quality in general is is it's interesting. I don't think we have all the answers yet. Thank you. Will do you have a, a number of how many fish kills there have been recorded Ooh. this year, and are there projections of what our fish kill situation might be? Yeah. I don't have those numbers, but I bet you that um, FWC uh, has those numbers and probably the water management districts for their local districts probably have a good sense of, of what those are. Um, forecasting into the future is, um, is really difficult. Um, these blooms are really hard to predict because they depend on so many variable factors. Um, weather, rainfall, temperature, um, it, it's really, really tricky. I think it's something that we, we should be really looking into more though. Um, and developing the predictive models is something that's a big uh, research push right now. I know the Army Corps of Engineers is really interested in having predictive models for Lake Okeechobee so that they can schedule their discharges and not end up transferring a bunch of toxic microcystin um, into the St. Lucie estuary near the Stewart area. Um, so that's, that's an area of ongoing active research. Other places in the U.S. do have started down that path. Uh, Lake Erie has a, has a simple prediction um, model and website where you can go. And I think that would be great to have around here. I think, um, I think that would be a fantastic thing to do. Um, but it takes funding and it takes, it takes, uh, takes research dollars to, to make that happen. Thank you. Um... Are you have you done many studies with the uh, how retention ponds uh, are they contributing? I have not directly, but um, a lot of the retention ponds are going to have a I would expect have a big impact on nutrients and how they end up in the lagoon, how much of the nutrients in surface runoff ends up in the in places like the lagoon or or larger water bodies so it's definitely an important piece of the puzzle um ideally uh natural wetlands would be a a sink for these nutrients they would be like sponges that would be absorbing up a lot of this excess nitrogen and phosphorus um so unfortunately florida through development and agricultural as well as urban and residential, we've lost a lot of those natural wetlands. Um, so those natural sponges that would be absorbing those excess nutrients are gone. And, and um, retention ponds, if they're done right, they could help fill in that, that missing gap. Um, but that's another area where I think we need, um, we need to look at it more and get a better understanding of what sort of impact they could have and how we can build them so that they do have a, a, a positive impact on water quality. And uh, would aeration uh, fountains in the, in the ponds or any, any kind of aeration? Uh, in small water bodies, you know, aeration could help um, to reduce algal blooms. Um, but in larger water bodies like the Indian River Lagoon, that's not really a, a, a scalable um option unfortunately um just too too much water can't aerate at all but in small like a small residential pond or, or something that that could help the situation do we have any other questions we're good did you have a question i, I was along this line i was just wondering what your feeling is about the research research you've done so far and is it contributing to good efforts to reduce the algal, algal booms? What's your personal opinion on this? Not a, not yeah. for a scientific analysis. Yeah. So I, I, I see myself, um, you know, as a scientist, sort of my, my role is to better understand the problem so that we can use that information to, to make informed management decisions. So, yeah. What do you think? What do you, what do you, 
it's like that. So it's 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 interesting. It's a it's it's a simple problem and it's a and it's a complicated problem at the same time. It's um it's simple in the sense that well um, algae need nutrients to grow. We're feeding them a lot of nutrients, so it's not really surprising that we have excess harmful algal blooms. Um, the solution in that sense is simple. We we need lower nutrient concentrations in these water bodies if we want to avoid these blooms. Unfortunately, how to achieve that is is the hard part of the question. And that's sort of out of my area of expertise, I guess, is what I would say. <laughs> Thank you. We have one more question. Yeah, sure. I've had a lot of people ask me or say that we should just cut more inlets into the lagoon and let the water flush itself out. What's your take on that? I, I'm very skeptical of that being an effective solution. Um, uh, it would improve flushing. Um, it would probably affect water quality. I don't know that it would necessarily have the desired results. Um, it would probably move things around. So you, the, the locations of the blooms might not be in the same place. But if you don't get rid of the nutrients, um, I don't know that you will ever get rid of the blooms. Um, the, there are other coastal systems that are much more open to the ocean that still get blooms. So unless you drastically change the environment, you know, get rid of the barrier island entirely, I, I don't know that you could really um, totally solve the problem in a way. And it would have a dramatic impact on the, the, an unpredictable impact on the local ecosystem. I don't know, you know, would the, maybe the pyridinium would go away and then all those bioluminescent kayak tours would be out of business. I don't know. <laughs> Hi. Um, my question is, I know over the years, we have literally destroyed a lot of our natural wetlands. Do you know, being that that is a good way to address, you know, the problem to get the nutrients out, have you heard of any ideas because of all of the development that's going on? of maybe creating some natural wetlands, you know, setting land aside to create a wetland rather than building on it? Um, there, I have heard some creative ideas. Um, I don't know how well, you know, I don't know, what I don't know is how well they would scale to really have a significant impact, but I think it's definitely something we should be looking into. Um, uh, we recently had at Harbor Branch our Indian River Lagoon Symposium, um, a couple weeks ago, and one of the talks there was this really interesting talk. I wish I could remember the man's name. I'm sorry, I don't. But um, uh, planting eelgrass in in um, in um, culverts and upland waterways that feed into the canals and feed into places like the Indian River Lagoon, and the eelgrass it can take a lot of that nutrients out of the water. Um, and treating those, those managed uh, canals and, and water systems, not just as you know, pipes that direct water, but treating them as uh, a living little ecosystem that we can, we can um, uh, grow plants in and grow fish in and, and, and help make more like a natural wetland, that, that something like that could have an impact. I don't think we know the answer yet, but I think it's worth looking into. You talked about micro, micro systems. Can you address uh, BMAs and the, their or, the role that uh, algae have in in that regard? Yeah, that's something that, um, as far as I understand, it has been really controversial. Um, the uh, there are a few scientists who are 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 really um, they're really concerned about these BMAs as and their potential role as a neurotoxin, and um, they. Uh, may be produced by a lot of different um, a lot of different cyanobacteria like the microcystis, but unfortunately, I think we just don't know enough. Um, there's it's BMAA turns out to be extraordinarily different, uh, difficult to measure. Um, so just even detecting it and determining how much is there is really hard. So I think a lot of the evidence is a little suspect, 
Um, and I, we need more research as, as far as I can tell. Um, it's, uh, we don't have a good answer on, on how big of a problem that really is yet. That's my take anyway. Thank you so much sure. uh, for joining us today. Will everyone please uh, give our presenter a big round of applause? And uh, we'll we'll be available here uh, for a few more minutes. Uh, but do uh, tell your friends about this presentation, and we hope you do come back and see us next month. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thanks for listening.